What's up, geographers? This is Coach Fishbine. Uh, I'm here to do your unit four review. This is my favorite uni unit. This is the one I like the most. This is the one uh, that I think has the most to do uh, with the world the way it is. So let's go ahead and dive into it and we'll see where we get. All right. So what is a state? Okay. In this unit, we're talking all about countries. We're talking all about states. And if you're like me in the United States of America, the question of what is a state might be a little confusing because we're used to calling our states in the United States states, and we're not used to calling other countries like France, Russia, Canada, Mexico states, right? We're used to calling them countries, but in reality, those places are states as well. Okay, so you see, to be a state, you have to fulfill these four requirements. Okay, you have to have a defined boundary. You have to have a population that's always there. All right, you have to be recognized by other states, which is a big deal. And you have to maintain sovereignty or the right to be able to control what's going on with your own borders. Okay, um, or within your own borders. Sorry. So in this um, in this review video, I actually have more words on these slides than I typically do. I try to typically avoid putting on a lot of words on these slides, but you'll notice um, that won't be the case today in this video. And I've actually bolded a lot of vocabulary words here. So pay special attention to those. Those are the ones that uh, I think the College Board wants you to know the most and, and make sure you know the definitions for those terms as well, okay? So a state, four conditions to be a state defined boundary, permanent people, recognition from other states, and you have to have the sovereignty to determine what's going on within that state, okay? Now, this is different than a nation, okay? For a state, you're thinking like, all right, this is the, the land and the government that runs what happens on that land. Uh, but nations are different. Nations are groups of people, okay? So to be a nation, you've got to have a common heritage, shared beliefs and values, you got to claim a traditional homeland. There's got to be a place on earth where you're pointing to and saying, that's where we're from. That's our home. And you have to got you have to have your desire for self-determination or the right to choose your own political status. All right. So those four conditions are what is necessary to be a nation. OK, so there's some places out there that meet all the conditions for being a state. And there's some other places out there that meet all the conditions for being a nation. And you'll see some examples of those places here in the center of this diagram. OK, the green circle is labeled states. The blue circle is labeled nations. And if you're in the center, you're both a state and a nation. So we're going to call that a nation state. OK, but there are some places that are states, but not nations and some places that are nations, but not states. All right, so that's what we're gonna dive into in the next few slides. But I would think about um, this Venn diagram in that way to make sure that you know that not every state is a nation, not every nation is a state. You have to satisfy both requirements to be a nation state. And there's a lot of states out there, including the United States, that are um, not nations for whatever reason, reason whether that's diversity, uh, or, you know, a, a few other examples. Okay. So a nation state is a singular nation of people who fulfill the qualifications of being a state. And you see some examples here. Japan is full of Japanese people. All right. It's a nation state. Poland, Polish people live in Poland. Hungarian people live in Hungary. Uh, Bangladeshi people live in Bangladesh, right? So, and it sounds obvious, right? But all the people, and don't be confused by me saying all as in every single person, but the vast majority of people in these states feel like they are a part of that group, whether that's Japanese people, Polish people, Bangladeshi people, Hungarian people, their identity, their allegiance um, is with that nationality, okay? All right, so let's go into some special types of states. We mentioned the United States before. The United States wouldn't be in the category of a nation state because it's a multinational state, right? It's diverse. And this uh, is, an, is a country that contains more than one nation. One nation is usually dominant, but we have a lots of different groups of people within the United States. We have Mexican-Americans, Filipino-Americans, African-Americans, Chinese-Americans, right? The presence of all those different nations makes the United States a multinational state. Uh, we have autonomous regions, all right? And these are defined places within a state that are somewhat independent. And Indian reservations are a great example of that, especially Indian reservations in California. Um, 
Those places have different a different set of rules. So here in California, you can go drive off to an Indian reservation that's that might be nearby, and and you can gamble there despite the fact that gambling is illegal within the state of California. A stateless nation is a nation. Remember, a nation's a group of people. So a stateless nation is a nation that wants their own state but doesn't have it, or at least not now. And Kurdistan and Catalonia are two great examples of that. Uh, and finally, we have a multi-state nation. So this is when a nation, again, a group of people, um, their extent spills over into multiple states. And Koreans are a great example of that because the Korean nationality uh, goes from South Korea and then north to North Korea. It's spread out over two different independent states. Irredentism is the idea that maybe a state wants to, what well, feels like another part of another state uh, belongs to them and they need to go out and, and bring it back. So for example, where I live here in San Diego, um, this territory used to be a part of Mexico. If there were people in Mexico who really felt strongly that Alta California should um, be reabsorbed into Mexico, they might take steps to make sure that that happens. Uh, I think that's pretty unlikely considering um, the power of the United States, but but that would be one such example. All right, how do states control other places? Namely, they they do imperialism, right? They expand their empire to other places, to other places beyond their borders. And one way in which they do imperialism is by setting up colonies in different places or practicing colonialism, right? You are probably an American, I am guessing, and you are probably familiar with the 13 American colonies, right? Virginia, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania. Um, those colonies were run by the British Empire for a long time until the colonists felt that the British Empire was treating them unfairly, so they rebelled and won independence for themselves, okay? But that process of colonialism was just one facet of the imperialism that the United Kingdom used, not the United Kingdom back then, but the but the British Empire used to control other places uh, for political and economic purposes, all right? Let's talk about the Berlin Conference, right? The Berlin Conference is one of the best examples of colonialism, all right? All these European powers meeting in Germany to decide how they want to slice up Africa for themselves, okay? You'll see there's a lot of different ethnic groups in Africa, and they group them all together into these colonies, not giving any regard for the different languages, religions, histories of those different ethnic groups, okay? Now, this situation didn't last forever. And in the 20th century, the world went through a process of decolonization or the undoing of colonialism, all right? And on this map, you see where all of these different countries within Africa, you see the year that they gained independence, okay? They gained independence from their colonial empires. Um, and now they're able to, to elect their own legislature, choose their own president or prime minister, Prime Minister, and they have the sovereignty now to decide how things go for their own country on their own. Okay. Um, however, you can see this is a more modern map of Africa, and the boundaries didn't really change too much throughout the process of decolonization. We still have a place called the Democratic Republic of the Congo right here that essentially has the exact same borders as the Belgian Congo had in the 20th century. Okay. And this has created a big problem throughout much of the continent of Africa one that can be summed up, summed up through the process of neo-colonialism, all right, or the use of economic, political, or cultural pressures to control or influence other countries, all right? And what's happening now in Africa is that it's not the countries that are doing the colonizing anymore. It's big multinational corporations that are housed here in the United States or perhaps in Europe or, or Asian countries like Japan or China, all right? And we call this neo-colonialism. The people of Africa are still dependent on support from countries like this, and they don't have as much sovereignty or autonomy uh, as it might seem uh, on first glance, okay? All right, let's transition a little bit and start talking about choke points. Narrow strategic passageways, often in water, but not all the time, um, through which it's difficult to pass. So whoever's controlling the choke points has uh, a considerable advantage over some other states. Uh, you see the Strait of Hormuz and the Strait of Malacca are two good examples here, all right? Lots of world trade um, happens on boats, just having to pass through these straits and um, 
And some geopolitics can sometimes get in the way of that. All right, shatter belts, regions where states form, join, and break apart, uh, often because of violence. All right, the Balkan Peninsula uh, in Europe is a great example of this. All right, there's, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine states maybe um, in this peninsula, but this was not always the case. All right, up until the late, later part of the 20th century, Yugoslavia uh, contained some of these states, but these different ethnic groups didn't always appreciate how they were treating each other. So Yugoslavia ended up breaking apart in a process called balkanization into these uh, several different states. All right. And an area like this is called a shadow belt. All right. Let's talk about borders. All right. So there's three processes that you got to know um, for borders. All right. The first is that borders are defined, right? Essentially, they're writing it down on a piece of paper. They're saying, OK, my house goes from that palm tree to that rock to the river in the back, okay? You're just saying where these borders are um, and you're writing it down like in a, uh, like a treaty, like this is a, like an image of the actual treaty the United States has with Mexico um, defining the border between those two states, all right? Borders are also delimited, all right? And this is just when you draw them on the map, all right? So here's an example of a map showing uh, the USA-Mexico border. And finally, Mex um, Mexico is not demarcated. Borders are demarcated. Um, and countries sometimes do this with walls. Um, if you're from San Diego like I am, you're probably familiar with this view of um, the San Isidro Port of Entry, this long line of cars waiting to get into the United States. States will do something usually to just show on the landscape, hey, this is a border. Here's a fence. Here's a port of entry um, facility. Here's a line. There's usually some sort of sign, something there that is showing where the border is, okay? All right, we're gonna start talking about different types of boundaries now. Uh, the first one that we're gonna go over is relic boundaries. These are former boundaries. These are, these are things that used to um, mark a boundary, but they don't do that anymore. And two great examples of that are the Berlin Wall, which used to separate uh, East Germany from West Germany, and, or the Great Wall of China, which marked the extent of the Chinese empire, all right? Neither of those places are official anymore uh, as far as boundaries are concerned, but they're still there and you could still go to them. Like I've been to the Berlin Wall in Kreuzberg where this picture was taken, pretty cool spot. The East Side Gallery. Uh, geometric boundaries. These are boundaries that follow lines of latitude and longitude or a straight line arc between two points. You see this line in particular, this border between the United States and Canada, it's an arc, right? It follows the curvature of the earth. This is an example of a geometric boundary. Um, this line of longitude up here between Canada and Alaska is also an example. There's tons of, of examples. Just take out a map and you'll probably be able to find one pretty quickly. Superimposed boundaries. These are when boundaries are drawn by somebody else, by some sort of outside conquering force. And you see, this is the Radcliffe line separating Pakistan from India. It was written, uh, drawn by this guy, Cyril Radcliffe, who was an Englishman, uh, and he drew it as the English were moving out of this region, moving, they're decolonizing Pakistan and India, and they split this into two states, and somebody had to draw the border. So Cyril Radcliffe went and did that, and that's what we call a superimposed boundary. Antecedent boundaries. So for the next few, you gotta, you gotta think, did the cultural landscape exist before or after um, the drawing of this boundary? If the cultural landscape, well, let me make, this, make sure I get this right. Um, if the cultural landscape developed after the drawing of the boundary, all right, that means the boundary is older, right? So the boundary is an antecedent boundary, all right? Th these boundaries are established before people settle into the area, all right? So this is an example of that uh, Canada-USA border that I mentioned earlier. OK, what they've done for most, if not all of this border is they've cut down the trees and essentially created like a gap signifying where the line is. It's not very accurate. This was done before they had advanced tools to make sure that this was super accurate. But it's a neat little landmark, um, landmark staple, the USA Canada border. And, and it's an example of an antecedent boundary. Subsequent boundaries are the opposite, all right? Subsequent boundaries have been drawn after the development of the cultural landscape. And most boundaries within Europe are examples of subsequent boundaries, all right? Like this border 
between Portugal and Spain. All right. Those two groups had already formed before the drawing of the boundary, making this a subsequent boundary. All right. And a consequent boundary is a type of subsequent boundary. All right. Let me say that again. A consequent boundary is a type of subsequent boundary that takes into account some sort of cultural difference. All right. So when Cyril Radcliffe was drawing the Radcliffe line, he was essentially trying to divide uh, Hindus from Muslims. All right. In a perfect world, he would have had all the Hindus in India and all the Muslims in Pakistan. OK. However, we don't live in a perfect world. So go do some research on on how that has worked out between those two states. All right. Let's move into the sea now. Uh, something you're going to have to know is the U.N. Convention on the Laws of the Sea. OK. Um, essentially, this law says that every state, uh, especially ones that have uh ocean boundaries have territorial seas that extend 12 nautical miles off the coast. All right. So here in San Diego, we've got the Pacific ocean, uh, just down the street, 12 nautical miles out from Pacific beach or ocean beach or mission beach. That is still American territory. Those are still American seas. Okay. Each country also has an exclusive economic zone that extends 200 nautical miles from the coast. All right. So essentially that's the zone where all the natural resources belong to the country, okay? Um, everything beyond that is international waters. It belongs to everybody, okay? Now, this is a screen grab I got from a Vox video explaining why China is building so many uh, islands off of the, uh, out, out in the South China Sea. And you see that this area, there's a lot of states here that have uh, exclusive economic zones that are kind of running into each other. This shaded area right in here, this these are the international waters. My light just went out. We'll have to fix that. Um, but these are the international waters. So what China is trying to do is they're trying to build islands and they're or they're trying to expand the Spratly Islands in this area so that they, they can take advantage of those natural resources. Okay. All right. Lights fixed. So let's get back to it. All right. Let's talk about federal states and unitary states. Federal states are states that have sub-national units within them, okay? So does that sound like the United States to you? It should, right? The states within the United States are sub-national units making the United States a federal state, okay? So we've got a federal government that is in charge of all the United States. Each state has a state government that's in charge of only that state. And then we have a third level down called a local government, right? The local government, which might be run by a city council and or a mayor, they're only in charge of that city. OK, uh, so all of those are aspects of federal states, uh, India, Mexico, Brazil, a few other examples of states uh, that are federal. All right. This is the opposite of a unitary state. A unitary state is going to have one government for the entire country. OK, and I took this grab from the true size of dot com. All right. So you're on, on that website, which I love. You're able to see the true size of countries. All right. You're not met. You're not like getting lost by the Mercator projection. OK, so what I've done here is I've uh, dragged three unitary states onto another unitary state in China. OK, so this is the outline of France, of Spain, of Japan. OK, and, and these are their actual comparable sizes, right? So of these four, which of these unitary states are going to have an easier time running their country, okay? It should be obvious that France, Spain, and Japan are all going to have an easier time running their one government that controls a much smaller region than China will that has one government to control everything that goes from, from like the eastern edge of Russia all the way over to like Kazakhstan, right? Uzbekistan, like that's thousands of miles. Okay. So something to keep in mind is that uh, unitary states can be pretty efficient, but if they have a lot of things to manage like China does, then that can pose a problem as well. Federal states have their own problems as well, right? Federal states can do a good job of making sure that local issues are solved by a local government. But what if that local government doesn't really like how things are going in a place like Mexico City or Washington, D.C.? Is that local government going to want to devolve and maybe go about it on its own? We'll get to that in just a second. OK. All right. But first, let's do some electoral geography. OK. A few words on this slide that you got to know. Voting districts, redistricting and reapportionment. 
Okay, we got this map of California. These are all the districts within California. Each of these districts sends one person to Washington, D.C. Um, to the House of Representatives. Okay, now we just had a census in this country, right? Every 10 years, we have a census. Uh, every year that ends in a zero, we have a census. So um, these districts have to be redrawn. All right, in a process called redistricting. California is actually gonna lose a representative, all right, or losing one to Texas. I mean, it's not literally going to Texas, but Texas is getting three, right? So shorthand, you know, we're losing one to Texas. Um, so the process of redistricting is gonna have to happen. And that one seat that we're losing, um, that is called reapportionment, okay? Now, uh, in California, we don't have this problem. Right, because we've got an independent commission that's going to draw these districts in a fair way. But in a lot of other states, the state legislatures draw the lines. So if the state legislature wants to act unfairly in a way that's going to make sure that whatever party's in power stays in power, then they're going to use a process called gerrymandering. Uh, the definition is there, right? You can read that on your own, but just know that the shorthand for gerrymandering is when the politicians are choosing their voters, okay? Usually it should be us, the voters, right? Choosing their politicians, but gerrymandering makes it so that the opposite is going on, all right? So uh, a person who's gerrymandering is going to draw a weirdly shaped district like those you see here in order to either group people together so that they're gonna win a small number of districts or you're gonna spread a group out so that they can't win any districts. Either way, no matter which one you do, you're limiting the political uh, sovereignty, right? The political willpower of that opposing group, okay? So gerrymandering, awful for democracy. If you live in a state that gets gerrymandered, speak up, call your state legislator, right? Call your governor, all right? Try to elect somebody who's gonna end that practice because you're not being represented uh, in a fair way. All right, uh, let's talk about devolution. Devolution occurs when the central power in a state is broken up amongst regional authorities within its borders, all right? Russia is another federal state, all right? And it's the largest state by land area, right? So they have to give the power out to the different regions within Russia. Uh, they have a few different terms, districts, oblasts. I'm not, not exactly sure what they're called, um, but they essentially have to spread the power out. OK, now devolution has like another type of connotation as well in that um, a state that's experiencing devolution might break up and have a state uh, or a region within that state become independence. And there's some factors that might lead to devolutionary pressures. One of those is uh, ethnic separatism. OK, so that occurs when people of a particular ethnicity, usually in a multinational state, identify more strongly as members of their ethnic group than as citizens of the state. So you see all these people here, they're Spaniards, right? They live within the country of Spain, but they're carrying the sign for independence because they feel more strongly that they're members of the Basque country, all right? They don't really want to be a part of Spain anymore. They want the Basque country to devolve from Spain uh, and become their own country so they can go about it alone, all right? Ethnic cleansing occurs when a state government may attack an ethnic group and try to eliminate it through expulsion, imprisonment, or killing, all right? This is what's going on in Myanmar, amongst a few other places in the world, where the Rohingya are a group of people within Myanmar, and the Myanmar government feels that they are illegal immigrants, all right? So they want to make sure that they're not in Myanmar anymore, essentially. So this has um, resulted in thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees, flashback to Unit 2, um, hundreds of thousands of refugees leaving Myanmar and going to other places in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Western Asia, the Middle East, uh, to flee that persecution. All right. Economic and social problems can also cause devolutionary pressures. All right. Uh, let's go back to Spain. You got the Basque country over here. This is also going on in Catalonia. Um, you see on these regions of the map, uh, the GDP per person is very high, okay? These are pretty rich regions economically of Spain as opposed to like the southern part right here. So essentially the people in this in this region feel like they're like bringing everybody up, right? They pay a lot of taxes to support this region and they don't feel culturally like they're a part of this region. So that's why you see a lot of independent sentiment uh, in the Basque country and in Catalonia, all right? Social problems can cause devolutionary pressure as well. 
you see on this map over here, sorry that there's no key, but um, you'll see in this area, this is Wales, right? This is an area uh, within the United Kingdom, one of the four countries within a country of the United Kingdom. They speak a different language than the rest of uh, the United Kingdom, right? The different colors are different languages. This color is English, this golden rod color. And then the purplish color signifies Welsh. That's the, the language they speak in, in a lot of different parts of Wales, right? So the Welsh people feel like they're not as respected by people in England and other parts of the United Kingdom. So uh, they want to go about it on their own as well. Supranationalism, all right? Supranationalism is kind of like the opposite of devolution because this is countries coming together, not to form a new country, but to form an alliance that's going to help them out um, and help them pursue some sort of common goal they have, whether that's uh, political protection, uh, economic expansion, or, or a bunch of different ones, okay? Um, so some examples of these supranational alliances, uh, you have the United Nations, this flag, um, is the this is the flag of the United Nations, probably the most well known and most powerful of all supranational organizations. But some other ones you should know are the European Union, NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, the ASEAN. Sorry, let me look that up. I forget the acronym. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations. That's what it is. All right. So that one you should know as well, uh, along with the African Union and the Arctic Council. Sorry, I forgot that one. Um, all right, let's start to wrap it up. Centripetal and centrifugal forces, uh, you should remember from the Unit 3 video, right? Centripetal forces unite people, centrifugal forces divide them. And they can lead to ethno-nationalism, which could really be either or, all right? If it's a centrifugal force, then you're starting to separate people. You're being div divisive. Right. And this ethno nationalism was bad news in the 20th century in Europe because it led to the rise in Nazi Germany and the outbreak of World War Two, 50 million people dying in that conflict. OK. On the other hand, currently in, in more contemporary times, you're seeing ethno nationalism uh, in a place like Belarus. All right. Belarusians um, are, are they're under the, the thumb of of Mr. Putin in Russia. Right. And not all, all Belarusians like that. So there's been a renewed interest in Belarusian culture. They speak Russian over there, but there's a significant movement of people who want to start speaking Belarusian again. So in this case, ethno-nationalism is a centripetal force. It's bringing people together. Okay. All right. That's it for unit four. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed that video. Hopefully you learned something from it. There are so many resources here on YouTube that are gonna help you st understand these vocabulary terms. So I'll link a few of them down in the description. Some of my favorite ones from, from places like Vox or CGP Grey or Wonder Why, um, but they do a great job of explaining how these forces work in the real world. And I'll hope you check out some of those resources down below um, so you can learn a little bit more. All right, guys, thanks so much for being here. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to leave a comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, and we'll be back in 2021 with a video for Unit 5. All right, see you later, everyone.